that will report about the results of the national lung matrix uh, trial. Thanks very much indeed. Um, so we presented the data from the National Lung Matrix trial. Um, and I really just want to put it into some context of what we were trying to achieve in this particular program. So this is a very large study, an umbrella study where we had lots of different arms of targeted agents with specific targets that we were going for. Now what we knew, and we've known for a long time now, that there are certain groups of patients with lung cancer that have got genomic aberrations that can be very effectively targeted, the so-called oncogene addictions. We've known since 2004, for example, that EGFR mutant patients can be treated very effectively with EGFR inhibitors and we just had a fantastic example of RET fusion patients treated with really highly active RET inhibitors. What you've got there is you've got a genomically simple tumour, often in a non-smoker with not lots and lots of other mutations, for example, and lot, lots of genomic instability that's got one driver that drives that tumour, that drives it to proliferate, drives it to avoid cell death. And when you switch that off with a single agent, it works fantastically. So you go, what we tried to do in this study was to ask a particular question. If we've got 20% of patients with lung cancer that got these great responses to monotherapy, how many slices of the molecular pie are there? How many other patients might there be out there with specific drivers that we can target with targeted therapy? This is what we really wanted to ask the question, and specifically, we wanted to ask the question, are there any good targets in patients that smoke? Okay, The vast majority of these patients that respond really well to these monotherapy targeted agents and non-smokers, as I said. We wanted to know something about whether patients with tobacco-associated non-small cell lung cancer, and in particular, squamous cell lung cancer, because these are all largely adenocarcinoma, we wanted to ask the question, could we find some decent targeted agents, some precision medicines, some personalised medicines for patients with squamous cell lung cancer? So basically, as I say, we had an umbrella trial of multiple signal, uh, single arm signal of activity phase two trials. And this is the study design, so there's lots and lots of arms in this. We've actually, at the moment, got 22 different biomarker cohorts, okay? In other words, we use next-generation sequencing. We found out what we think the driver might be in that particular patient, then we match it up to one of eight targeted therapies, as you can see down here. So quite a big study. And what we reported out on today was 19 of these arms. Now, I'm going to keep it brief, because I just want to make one specific point about all of this, okay? I've just got a couple of data slides that I specifically want to point to. Now, the first one is this one here. This is using a drug called palbocyclib. Okay, it's a CDK4 inhibitor. And you've got four different cohorts here, and I'm not going to go through the statistics again, but four different cohorts, which just basically show the median progression-free survivals. They're actually the Bayesian estimates of the median progression-free survival. And you can see here that the PFSs range from this one here, this is CDK4 amplification at two months, up to 4.5 months for this one here, which is CDK into a loss, in a squamous cell carcinoma patients. Now, you've just seen the stuff with RET fusion where you've got these huge progression-free survivals. If you look at ROS fusion treated with crizotinib, that's out at the 19-month mark. If ozimertinib, that'll be out at the 16-month mark. You can clearly see that with these, this drug, with this particular group of patients, we're not seeing anything like that. And indeed, particularly, we're not seeing anything like it in these squamous cell patients with these CDK and 2A losses, which is the commonest abnormality that you see in squamous cell lung cancer. Similarly, one of the commonest mutations you see and the commonest amplifications you see is in PIX3CA. Okay, so we thought, well, we'll take patients with PIX3CA mutations with squamous cell tumours or PIX3CA amplifications and we'll treat them with an AKT inhibitor. That's immediately downstream of that. And we thought that would probably be a good idea. But in fact, you can see here that for these patients, so these patients F1, that's PIX3CA mutation, F2 is PIX3CA amplification, look at these. Durable clinical benefit rate, that stabilisation or better at the six-month mark, is down below 15%. And we've got no responders at all. In other words, again, a very common mutation in squamous cell lung cancer that we rationally targeted with a targeted therapy we're seeing very, very little. And yet this study clearly shows that we can pick up oncogene addictions because down here we've got a group of patients who've got standard oncogene addictions. So at the bottom here, these are T790M EGFR patients responding beautifully well to ozimertinib. And then we've got two crizotinib cohorts, one with ROS fusion and one with met exon 14 skipping mutations that respond really well. This is what you see with oncogene addictions, massive levels of DCB rate, very high median progression-free survivals, very high objective response rate. So what does this all mean? What does this mean for the patients that have got these smoking-related cancers, and in particular the squamous cell cancers. Well, what I think is that this really, for me at least, is, if you like, the beginning, the sort of end of the beginning, right? We've done lots and lots in terms of targeted therapies, particularly in non-smoking lung cancer. We've got to think 
again, about what we do with patients, particularly with squamous cell lung cancer. I don't think we can copy the paradigm of single agents going for oncogene addictions. That's not going to work. If you look at this waterfall plot here, this is by the entire trial by histology. And out here, on the right-hand side of the waterfall plot, the patients are doing well. These are all the non-squamous patients. Squamous patients, look, they're only over this side, okay? We're seeing very, very little, if any, of significant responses. So just my final slide, really. It may be that in these patients with squamous cell lung cancer, is a good target, but we're just going about the wrong way of approaching it. We think target, we think single agent, and then we expect it to be a massive response rate, like REP, for example. I don't think that's the right way forward. These two drugs that I've just talked about, okay, capivacitib and palbacitib, cyclib in these squamous cell patients with no responses. If you look in estrogen positive breast cancer, you almost see exactly the same thing. Again, very, very low levels of activity when you use them as a single agent. But when you use them in a rational combination, it provides very significant benefits indeed. And critically, it's not dependent upon whether you've got a genomic aberration activating that particular molecule. In other words, for example, if you look at capivacitib in combination with fulvestrin, and you treat that treat those patients. It doesn't matter whether you've got a PIX3CA mutation above that or not. We need to start thinking about the targets, perhaps independently of genomic aberrations activating it, and thinking about it in rational combinations. Monotherapy, I don't think, is going to work. And one final point is that even though we might have a good target, we've got to accept the fact that smoking-related lung cancer is very different from breast cancer. It's very, very genomically complex. It's very unstable. There's ongoing evolution, for example, lots of oncogene redundancy and lots of resistance. Okay? And again, I think the very important thing is that when we start to think about taking drugs into the clinic, some of the models that we use can be very genomically simple. Okay, the preclinical models, particularly some of the mouse models, the transgenic models that really don't replicate the genomic complexity of the tumour. We've got to start thinking about preclinical work which really does replicate the genomic chaos of the diseases that we're actually treating and the target that we're trying to target. Thanks very much.